I want to look at finding image charges for a grounded conducting sphere. But before I do that, let's review the uniqueness theorem for potentials. So if you consider a volume V bounded by a surface S, and if the potential V is specified on the surface, then Laplace's equation has a unique solution in the volume. So that unique part, unique solution. Once you find a solution, you know it has to be the right solution because the solution is unique. In Laplace's equation, in case you forget, that would be the del squared of v equals zero. It's a special case of the Poisson equation. And here's the problem. A point charge Q is located a distance d from the center of a grounded conducting sphere with a radius of r. Find the potential everywhere outside the sphere. So here's our sphere and we'll say it has a radius of r and I'll align it along the z-axis and put a point charge q a distance d away from the center. And so we want to find the potential everywhere outside the sphere, everywhere out here. Okay, so here's the problem again and let's look at the boundary conditions. So we know that it's a grounded conducting sphere. That means on the sphere v equals zero, the potential is zero. Also, at infinity, v approaches zero. As we get further and further away from the sphere, we would expect that v should approach zero. And we're going to use the method of images. So instead of having our uh, grounded conducting sphere, we're going to consider a situation where there's no sphere, but instead there's another image charge. And if it's possible to satisfy the boundary conditions, then the potential outside the sphere will be the same as it was in the original problem. Okay, so to begin, let's get rid of the conducting sphere. And instead, we're going to replace it with another little charge. Now, I still, I still kept the outline of the conducting sphere here. We're going to pretend it's not there anymore, but we're going to try and match the boundary conditions there. So that's why I left it there. So here's my other little charge. I'll call it big Q, and we'll say it's a distance A away from the center of the, uh, what used to be the conducting sphere. And the goal now is to figure out what A and Q have to be in order to mimic the boundary conditions. So in order to do this, I'm going to pick a place where I know uh, I want the potential to be zero. So one place would be, say this place right here. So I'll call that point capital A here, point A. And then I'm gonna pick another point. And I'll pick this point down here and I'll call this point B, and I'm going to use these two points to figure out exactly what this distance little a is from the center of the sphere and uh, what the magnitude of this charge big Q has to be. Now you might wonder also, how did I know to put Q right here on the z-axis? Why couldn't it be over here or over here or down here or something like that? But if you think about it, by symmetry, this Q has to be here because if I want to try and get the potential to be zero everywhere on this surface right here, um, it wouldn't make sense to have it you know, over here or down here. And I certainly can't put the image charge out here because I'm trying to calculate the potential outside the sphere and you can't put image charges in places where you're trying to calculate the potential. So it has to be somewhere in here and just from symmetry it only makes sense to be on the z-axis. Okay, so let's look at first uh, point A. And so at point A, I know that the potential at point A has to be zero. So remember, we don't have the sphere anymore. We just have two point charges. So I can calculate the potential from each of the point charges, add it up, and then set it equal to zero. So I first have one over four pi epsilon naught, and then I have my little Q here. And then I need the distance. So let's see here. So here's little q, here's point A. This distance right here is what I want. And let's see, well this distance to the center is D. And if I subtract the radius of the sphere from that, then that should work. This should be D minus R for the, the distance there. Okay, plus I'm gonna add the potential from my other point charge now. So I still have another one over four pi epsilon naught and I have a big Q. And let's see, we're, here's my big Q, here's point A, so I want this little distance right here. Well, this is the radius R, and then little a is here, so if I do R minus A, that should work. 
that'll be that distance. And we know that when I add those up, I should get zero because the potential at point A should be zero. Great. Now let's look at point B. So for point B, I'm gonna do a very similar thing. So I'm gonna first write the potential from point charge, little q here. Okay, what's that distance? So that's from here all the way down to B, down here. Well, if this is D, I need to go another R to get to B. So this must be D plus R. All right, and now I'm gonna add in the potential from the big Q charge. So here's big Q. Big Q is right here. Point B is down here. So this is A plus R or R plus A, keep it in the same order here. And that equals zero because the potential at point B should also be zero. Okay, so all of these one over four pi epsilon naughts, they can go away. So what I end up getting is for the first equation here, Q over D minus R equals, and this will be negative if I bring this over to the other side, Q over R minus A. And then this equation would give me Q over D plus R equals negative big Q over R plus A. And so now I have two equations with essentially two unknowns, the big Q and the little a. And I wanna try and write those two things in terms of the other variables. Okay, so to do that, I can cross multiply with each of these. So if I call this equation one here and I call this equation two, then equation one, I'll write down here and I'll equation two, I'll write down here. So equation one, if I were to cross multiply here, I would get Q times R minus A. And then equals, and this would be negative now, Q times D minus R. And then for equation two, I get little Q times R plus A. And that's going to equal negative big Q times D plus R. Okay. So at this point now, I will uh, distribute everything out for each of these. So this will be QR minus QA equals. And I have a minus sign here, so if I wanted to, I could uh, rearrange the order. But I'm going to maybe leave it like, well, I guess I'll, I, I, could, I could do negative Q times negative R, make it positive QR. Okay, fine, I'll do that. So I'll make that QR. How about that? And then this will stay minus now, so this will be uh, Q times D. And now I can distribute this. I get QR plus QA equals. And now I would like to kind of keep this in the same order as the equation above. So I want the QR term first, but that is going to have a minus sign. So it would be minus big Q, big R. And then minus big Q, D. Okay, uh, how about uh, if I add these two equations together? If I add them together, then I would get 2QR. These terms would cancel. Uh, these terms would cancel, and I would get negative 2QD. All right, I can get rid of the twos on both sides. And I think this now is an equation for big Q. If I solve this for big Q, I would get the big Q is equal to negative Q, little Q, R over D. All right, so that's one of my equations right there. Let's put a box around that. So that's one of the two equations that I wanted to find. I want another equation now for the little a term here. So how am I gonna find that? Well, to get the little a term, I could, uh, if I wanted to, um, try and plug back in for big Q into one of these equations and do some algebra, or instead, I could maybe subtract the second equation from the first. So if I were to do that, then I would get big QR minus big QR. Those terms would go away. 
I would get negative QA minus QA. That would be minus 2QA. I would get QR plus QR now because I'm subtracting. So that would be 2 big QR. And this would be minus QD plus QD. Those terms would go away. So now I have this. I can get rid of the twos again like I did before. And I would get A is equal to negative, and I'll have a QR over a little Q here. Big Q, big R over little Q. But I would like to write it in terms of all the other variables. I know what big Q is. So this is... Um, I'll write the negative r over little q first, and then here's big Q. Big Q is negative qr over d, and if I do some simplification here, the negatives will go away, the little q's will cancel, and I will get r squared over d. And that is a, so I'll write it like that so I can put a box around it, and then here I have found now the location of the image charge and uh, how big the image charge has to be in order to make sure that on the surface of my uh, conducting sphere, which is no longer there, but if it were there, uh, I'm getting a potential of zero everywhere on the surface. So these values will guarantee that. So this should work now. This should be my image charge right here, and this is where it should be located. Okay, well now I know the value of big Q and little a, so I can go ahead and I can calculate the potential outside the sphere, somewhere out here. In fact, let's pick a point, we'll say we have a point P right here, and I wanna calculate the potential at that point P right there. Well, if this works, then the potential at this point P, uh, where I have my point charge Q above a grounded conducting sphere, that potential should be the exact same as if I just have these two point charges. So I know how to calculate the potential from two point charges. That's very easy. I'll just say it's one over four pi epsilon naught. And then I have my little q, and I'll say that that's a distance r plus from p. And then I have one over four pi epsilon naught. And I have my big q, and I'll say that that's a distance r minus from p. So I just need to figure out what r plus and r minus are. So my point P here will say that that has uh, coordinates x comma y comma z, just some general coordinates here. And we'll say that this point charge Q, which is on the z-axis, and if this is my origin at the center of the sphere, then this would be at 0, 0, d. And then my charge big Q here is also on the z-axis, so this would be 0, 0, A. And now I can use the distance formula to figure out what R plus and R minus are. So in this case, R plus is going to be the square root of, so these would be these two coordinates, or these two points here uh, between P and Q. So this would be an X squared, would be X minus 0 squared um, plus uh, Y minus 0 squared plus, and then I would have z minus d squared. And then all of that would be square rooted. And then my r minus would look very similar. It's going to be an x minus 0 squared plus a y minus 0 squared plus z minus a squared. All that square rooted. And now I can just put this into my potential formula. So I would get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. I'll just pull that outside because that's going to be there for both terms. And then I'm going to have, let's see, I have my r plus comes first, so that's going to be x squared plus y squared plus z minus d squared, and then all of that is square rooted. And up top I have q. And then I have my big Q here, so... Um, that's going to be, it's going to make this a minus, and I'm going to have a qr over d on top here. That's from this value for the big Q up top. And then I have a square root of x squared plus y squared plus z minus, and instead of a, I will write r squared over d squared. And then all of that is square rooted. 
Okay, and then I close up my parentheses. And if I want to, I can uh, do a little bit of algebra on this. I could pull the Q out, because I have a Q in each term. I could bring this D downstairs, but this is more or less what you need right here. This is the potential. And if we remember uh, the boundary conditions, we know that on the boundary uh, of the sphere here, when we have um, any place that's on here, we should expect the potential to be zero. And we should also expect that as we go to infinity, that the potential should end up being zero. And I think if you check this expression right here against those two conditions, that it does indeed work. So since we have found a solution that matches the boundary conditions, even though we didn't use the actual situation, we used some other situation, it doesn't matter. The uniqueness theorem guarantees that this has to be the solution for the potential.